Good morning, ReaperCon. I am Dan Holmes. I am the president of the IPMS Commies, the Colorado Mil Modeling Militia Enjoying Sci-Fi. We're a scale modeling club based in Denver, Colorado. Uh, however, we've got members all over the, the planet, and uh, we're not just into sci-fi or anything like that. So you can look us up on, uh, on Facebook under IPMS Commies. And today, I, uh, for the last day of ReaperCon, I'm going to be teaching an air, uh, maintenance on an airbrush, uh, how to use it, uh, how to clean it, how to uh, control it a little bit better, maybe some tips and tricks that I've learned on that kind of stuff, um, how, to, how to troubleshoot things when, it, when they go wrong, et, et cetera. I've been teaching this class every single day at ReaperCon, and I am exhausted. Uh, I've had an awful good time at, at ReaperCon. This is the first time I've ever been able to go. Uh, I don't get to travel in September, so this is the only way that I was going to get to go, and I've really missed my cons. I teach this class at, at various conventions in, in the Denver area, and they're always well-received as well. So first thing I want to talk about is what an airbrush is, and I'm going to switch. Well, actually, what I first want to talk about is if you've got any questions, put them into the chat. Uh, Either John or Justin is going to be reading the chat. I'm not going to be able to see no. it, so they're going to actually interrupt and uh, just feed those questions to me directly. Um, I, I want you to ask them while I'm I'm demonstrating a technique or uh, something like that to, to be able to incorporate that into the class. Uh, so let me switch my camera over to my spray booth. And at its simplest form, an airbrush is just a fancy spray can. You've got an air source of some sort, and in a spray can, it's just propellant. In an airbrush, it's, it's a, a compressor or a tank or something along those lines. That air comes up through the, through the uh, bottom of the airbrush and then goes out through the front. It mixes with the paint in the front of the airbrush. There's a needle and a nozzle right there that, that deliver the paint and help atomize that and give you a, a spray. And You can control the amount of paint that comes out by, uh, on a double action airbrush you can control it by pulling the trigger back. And however far back you pull the trigger is going to move the needle. It's going to move the nozzle out there. And I'll show the inside of these things so that uh, we've got a little better, better idea of it. Um, press down on the trigger to get the air to come out. So there's a couple of different main kinds of airbrushes. There's a single action airbrush. And what a single action airbrush means, this is just missing the tip on it. This is an old Aztec that doesn't work anymore. But what a single action means is that the, the trigger only uh, allows air to come out. And you control the, the distance that the nozzle is coming out, generally by a little wheel on the back here. And the nice thing about these uh, single actions is if you're, you're uh, spraying large areas like murals or lots of terrain or something like that, you've only got really one variable to worry about, and they're not nearly as fatiguing, because all you got to do is just press it down rather than have to, to pull back. Um, you can just set your line width right here, and it'll spray that all day, every day. So th these are a really good option if all you're going to be doing is priming or doing terrain or something like that. But I can almost guarantee you that once you get an airbrush, you're going to start learning uh, other techniques and, and other things that you can use it for. And so you start out with a, with a double action airbrush. And what that means is that you've got the air goes down like this, and then you pull back to get the, the paint. And it, it's an infinite amount uh, of adjustment there with the needle. All of the airbrushes that I've got here are all double action, and they're internal mix airbrushes. So for example, the, the, an external mix airbrush, the paint uh, wouldn't travel in the airbrush body. It would actually be on a, on a little nozzle out the end here, and then the air would actually uh, suck that paint up out of, the, uh, out of the container and spray it out. Those are really good if you're spraying really wide areas. Um, you, you've probably seen, um, like in Home Depot or, or other home improvement stores, you've got really large, large spray guns. A lot of those are external mixes. But all of these are an internal mix where the needle in the nozzle uh, the, the paint mixes directly in the needle in the nozzle. The needle in the nozzle is, is really where the action happens. You can get different sizes, uh, anywhere from a, like a 0.12 millimeter up to around a 0.6 or so millimeter. I've got an Iwata airbrush here. I've got the new Reaper Vex airbrush. I've got a Harder and Steenbeck Infinity. And I've got a Badger Sotar. Uh, they're all just slightly different. 
Uh, they all do just a, uh, do the same job, but just a di little bit different, different method of it. They're all extremely good airbrushes. I've had this Vex now for, for about two weeks, and I've been very impressed with it. Um, but I will show the differences uh, across different airbrushes here and, and what you may look for. This first one, this Iwata Eclipse, this was my very first airbrush. I've had it for, oh, 15 years or so, something like that, maybe a little bit more. And it is just an absolute workhorse. The, the main difference between this one and my other ones is the way the paint delivers. You can get a gravity feed or to, in two airbrushes. You can do a gravity feed on airbrushes or you can do a siphon feed. Siphon feed will actually suck the paint up straight out of the bottle here. That's really nice if you're, again, spraying very large areas or you're spraying lots of paint like on a, a t-shirt or uh, uh, something along those lines where you've got uh, a lot of paint. You can also change the colors very easily because all you got to do is just pull this out and pop, pop a new one in there and it'll, it'll automatically uh, change the, the color. You don't need to worry about cleaning out the color cup or anything like that. I didn't know when I was first starting out whether I wanted a gravity feed or if I wanted a siphon feed. And so that's, that's why I've got a side bottle so I can use it either way. The other nice trick about a side bottle is that when you're siding down, down the actual airbrush, the color cup isn't in your way. The bad news about it is it's a little bit off center with that, that color cup, especially when you've got this full of, of paint. It's, it's a little bit tippy on, it, on its side. The Vex, and these other airbrushes have got the color cup up on the top here. And as far as a, a, the, the gravity feed up here, it generally uses a lot smaller, or I'm sorry, a thinner paint. Uh, you're, you've got to thin it down to about 2% milk or so. Um, I don't like speaking in actual ratios of, of what you've got to thin your paint down to. And we'll get more into thinning paint here in a little bit. But generally 2% milk is a really good starting point. Uh, if your needle is, is extremely small, then you've got to go a little bit thinner. If it's uh, a lot, uh, lot larger needle, you can generally go a little bit thicker, but 2% but is a good rule of thumb. So there's different size color cups that you can get with airbrushes. You can see here, this one's got hardly any color cup at all, this Badger Sotar. And so I just usually put just a few drops of ink or, or uh, some sort of paint in there. Um, I like it. I like that, again, because I don't have that color cup in my way uh, to, to get out of there. The bad news is, is one, it doesn't hold very much paint. But two, if I tip it a little bit, that paint's going to end up spilling out very easily. Some airbrushes, uh, the Vex does come in two different size color cups. Some airbrushes, you can actually change the size of the color cup. Personally, I like a little bit smaller color cup. Um, and I'll show why here in just a sec. So like this harder in Steenbeck, you can get different size color cups for it. On up to... This isn't, this isn't even the largest one. The, uh, the, I personally like, like I said, I personally like a smaller color cup, especially with a detail airbrush. One, because when you're doing really small, fine details, I usually only use a few drops of paint at a time uh, because with, with a real detail airbrush, a few drops of paint will go an awful long ways. The other reason is when you've got a larger color cup up here and, and you start filling it up for, for bigger jobs, it starts to get really heavy and off center a little bit. You, 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 it weighs down, it'll uh, tip on the front on you, it'll, it'll wanna move like that, etc. So I personally like sticking with smaller color cups. And you can, you can actually leave it open like this. The only reason to uh, uh, put this little micro color cup on this guy is uh, to keep paint out of your threads. Some airbrushes, have what's called a MAC valve, a uh, manifold air control, I believe is what they, they end up calling it. And basically it's a way of controlling your, the amount of air that's going through here at the airbrush rather than having to, to go back to the compressor. So if you're, you're spraying something that uh, is super thin and your compressor's set up and it, it suddenly starts uh, uh, spidering on you or something along those lines, you can actually turn this, this little knob and it'll control the amount of air that's going through there.
it doesn't really seem to stop the pressure. It actually, it, it more control uh, the amount of actual air that's flowing in. It ends up working kind of like pressure, but it's not an actual pressure regulator. It's more of just a manifold. Uh, a couple of a couple other things between the Vex and the, these other airbrushes. A uh, couple of things I do like, a couple of things I don't like. Um, one is the, this is made by Badger, and Badger ends up using a little bit different size air connection than what other airbrushes use. And so these are, this is an Iwata quick disconnect set. And so what you do is you just pull on that and you can end up disconnecting it. But you can see where there's two different sizes. This isn't a bad thing. Uh, it, it's the same amount of air. You look at the hole and they're, they're essentially the same thing. It's just the size of the fitting that needs to go on there. This just happens to be able to, the VEX happens to fit the Iwata sized quick disconnects. So it was real easy for me to get a, get a connection on there. I like that. With the Badger, I had to get, a, get an adapter. Again, it's not a big deal. It's just something you got to remember to do. The maintenance on the VEX is real easy to do. Uh, they, they've got it set so that the, the needle chuck back here, you just un, undo that and you pull out the needle and, and away you go. You, and we'll show how to strip it down and, and uh, fix a bent needle, things like that. Uh, you tighten those, that chuck, that'll actually clamp down on that, on that needle and you can pull it out. The, uh, the bad thing is, is that you can't pull this part off without also pulling the needle. This back here is your, your preset handle. It's a, it's a little nut that connects back there and lets you only move the trigger back up as far as you need it to go to get a specific size of line. So it almost turns this into a single action type airbrush. Um, it, it is a nice feature. And a lot of your higher end airbrushes, like my Harder and Steenbeck and my Sotar, do, ha do have that. They're, they're, it's a very nice feature. Um, so then you can actually pull the back end of this thing off if you need to get to it. Um, one, one nice feature with the VEX is it's very easy to change. With the trigger going back and forth here, there's, there's a spring in here that is a little bit harder to, uh, oh, what do you wanna say, harder to control. It, it, it can be fatiguing because it, it can be kind of a tough spring. And so you can actually back this off a few turns and it'll, it'll take that tension off the spring and actually make it a much easier to control. Let's go ahead and put this back. Oh, one other thing to notice with the, the VEX, and this is, this is true in a lot of Badger's airbrushes, uh, there's this little doohickey right here, and you just kind of hold it with your thumb, and you can kind of move it back a little bit. But the trigger likes to pop out. Uh, there's nothing, uh, there's no positive connection into the air valve to hold the trigger. So you got to make sure that you get that stuck in there before you reassemble it. You can just hold the, the spring back with, with your... Uh, with your finger right there, your thumbnail right there. That'll get it back in. You've probably seen with, uh, with uh, other, other demonstrators that uh, sometimes that trigger is a little bit tough to get your nozzle in there. I think Lovejoy had problems with that. Every now and then I do too. But you just kind of move it back and forth and it'll get in there. Tighten down the chuck and away you go. It does come with two different size needles and, uh, uh, and it does only use one size of nozzle. Uh, that is one nice thing about it is you, you can get the, uh, the needle and nozzle as an unmatched set. Most airbrushes, the needle and nozzle to make sure that that taper fits are a, uh, are, are a uh, matched pair. Over on the front end of the airbrush, you've got the crown cap up here. And on the VEX, it's a solid round piece uh, on other airbrushes, it's, it's also a solid round piece. On some airbrushes, it's a open piece like that. And the, let's see, well, we could move it down a little bit. The idea behind the, the open piece is that when you're spraying up close to something, your air is gonna be impacting your, your uh, uh, object, and then it's gonna be shooting right back directly at you in, uh, in the uh, back up into the airstream, and it's going to interfere with that. An open piece lets the air spread out a little bit more. So most people, when they've got a a, uh, a crown cap like that, they end up just pulling it apart and just leaving it off. The problem there is, then you're going to you're, you're going to drop the airbrush and maybe bend to the needle. So the Vex, you can actually turn it around 
and put it on there. Now, it's not going to protect all of the needle. There's still just a little bit sticking out, but it is going to protect it uh, much more from, the, uh, from a fall or, or hitting something, things like that. We got any questions so far in chat? I've been talking quite a bit while I set up for my next demonstration here. Uh, there was one about uh, atomization. Uh, they were having an issue. It says, what would cause my airbrush to atomize upwards? Okay. Uh, or some other weird angle versus straightforward. They said they clean their needle and regula regulator tip as well. So that's a, good, that's a good question. Let's go ahead and open up the front end of an airbrush and show how it works. This, again, is my Awada Eclipse. So here's the nozzle here. You've got the needle. That needle fits inside of that nozzle. And this is, this is actually where your money for an airbrush is going, is the machining of this piece right here, the, the, the connection joints along here, because they've got to be very, very precise. What I was talking, you know, 0.15 millimeter point, uh, on up. I mean, you, you can tell that those have to be very, very precise. There's a taper here and along here. When you, when you disassemble an airbrush and you reassemble it, when you put the nozzle back on, if you reef really hard down on the, the front end of it, I'm going to move my, my uh, airbrush down so everybody can see. When you, if you reef really hard down on the front end of it, the front of this, the, the front nozzle piece, can actually impact the front of your nozzle here and cause it to flute out, or it'll crack it, or something along those lines. And a crack in there will cause paint to squirt in a different direction rather than straight out. Uh, because again, you're not going to have that finely matched piece where it's sealed up here, and then as it pulls back, it's going to pull back in, a, in an even piece, but you're going to end up going in a, in a different direction. Um, also, when you are putting your needle in, you want to just go very slowly until it stops. And again, I'm doing all this without the front end here, just so I can show. But if you push the needle in, you're going to hit that nozzle in the front. See how that ends up moving? See how that ends up moving the nozzle in there. If it's locked in there at the top, as it should be, then you're going to, again, crack that front of the nozzle. So what I would do, if you're squirting paint in a different direction, I would check your nozzle. And I will show right now. This is skipping ahead just a little bit, but it's a good time to do it. Iwata makes a tool uh, that's a 30 power and a 60 power magnifier, and I'm not going to be able to show it with this camera here, but you can actually go in there and actually look at what your needle and your nozzle look like uh, and replace them. Unfortunately, a nozzle is a wear item, and you're just going to end up having to repair them or uh, replace them every now and then. They're, as far as I can tell, there's no good method of repairing. I've, I've tried a couple of methods, and they're, they're just too finely machined for me to be able to do with just hand tools that I've got here at the house. Uh, so they're, they're just a, a wear item. I suggest when you, when you need to buy them that you buy two of them so that you've always got one in stock because they invariably break at about three o'clock in the morning and then you're, you're hosed. You can't, you can't do anything about it. But if you've got one in stock, then you can, then you can continue on and then uh, you can order another two at your leisure because you've already still got one in stock. So if something catastrophic happens and you lose your second one, you're not, you're not dead in the water. Always be redundant. I think I heard about that in uh, one of the, uh, the Reaper, uh, history of Reaper things where they ended up going with multiple machines so that if one of them died, they could replace it. So again, just keep, keep the uh, tension off of that, that needle and nozzle so it doesn't flute out. I only tighten hand tight right there so it'll seal up. And then just, again, put, it, put the uh, needle up against the nozzle. And then you noticed I gave it just a little bit of a twist. And that'll just make sure that the, the needle and nozzle are actually seated together. And then tighten it down and away you go. You may end up having, uh, uh, especially on an older airbrush like this, where parts are starting to kind of wear out a little bit, uh, there may be uh, some sealing problems that you've got along here. Uh, and I can show what will happen with that when you spray water. And that's all I'm going to spray today is just some water. I'll get into that. This is Chinese um, brush painting practice paper. They practice calligraphy on it. You can, you can uh, just spray water and it'll dry reasonably quickly. So 
that's a, these are actually a good method to practice. I'll get more into that. But if this isn't sealed quite right, you're going to end up having, having bubbles and this other airbrush over here shows it better. You can kind of, I don't know if you can hear spurting or not, but you're going to end up getting air leaks in here that are going to also cause problems. Um, to fix that, there are products that Iwata and Badger both make that are kind of a lube. This is, uh, this is called Super Lube here. This is from Iwata. And it, you only need about a drop or so on the end of that, that needle, and not, uh, needle uh, to, to lube it up, and that kind of helps seal things. You can also get beeswax if it's uh, uh, really loose up here in the front, etc. So I didn't lube this one when I was putting it back. I probably should have, but, but I did not. All right, so that's that's pretty much how an airbrush works. Um, pretty much how your usage uh, uh, or maintenance of it, things like that. The the action's all up in here. If you end up getting bubbles in your paint cup, or okay, let, let's back up a little bit. So air wants to go out the front of the airbrush. The, that's way the the airbrush was designed. Let me move it down a little bit. That's the way this has been designed: is to have air shooting out the front end of the airbrush. So if so if paint isn't perfectly going out here, that means that something is impeding the air path here and making it easier for the air to go some other direction. You know, paint, uh, air wants to go path of least resistance. So if you end up having bubbles in the paint cup, you're going to end up with, uh, there's a clog up in here, or there's a, a, a dried paint or something along those lines that are going to cause problems, get your air to your, your paint to bubble up in there. Uh, you can see, let's see, I've got enough in here. Let's see if I can hold. Yeah, you can start seeing a little, few, few little bubbles coming up through the bottom there. So you can see it's all, it, if you've ever got bubbling up there, it's always going to be a clog of some sort, whether that be tip dry or, or a, a cracked needle nozzle, something in there is going, going wrong. And that's true of any, any brand of airbrush. All right, so let's talk a few more things about maintenance. Uh, let me dump that paint out, or that, that water out. Uh, you can see I, I uh, do all of my maintenance on one of these. Uh, this is a neoprene uh, cover here, and all it does is just, when I, if I drop something, it doesn't hit something hard, uh, like uh, the inside of my paint booth. It's not gonna hit anything hard, it's, it's nice and soft, and it keeps, it's got a rolled edge here so that it keeps everything from rolling away. So we have gone through and accidentally hit something, dropped our needle and kind of bent it a little bit. And we can confirm that bend by looking at it in here. And there's just a tiny, yep. Yeah, in fact, I, I, uh, I didn't bend it so much as I just dulled the tip. There's a couple of different ways of fixing that. And it's gonna happen, so just expect it. Uh, all of us have accidents, things like that. So a couple of different ways. If it, if it just needs just a little bit of tip polish like that, take a piece of corrugated cardboard, but just from a shipping container. This is just from whatever I bought from Amazon last. And bend it on one of the corrugations so that you got a fairly straight line. And then hold, holding it with, with a finger at the uh, taper end here so that it kind of goes up a little bit, just kind of drag it while you're spinning it on that cardboard. And that'll just kind of polish it back and, back and forth a little bit. And just be kind of, kind of gentle with it and away you go. If you've got something stronger than that in there like a hook or a, uh, a, a good bend, something along those lines, you can do the same kind of thing by taking a, a cheap piece of bathroom tile I just had this uh, left over from a bathroom remodel and do the exact same thing. You can, you can just hold it as a, as a taper and just kind of move back and forth as you're going. And that'll kind of polish, polish that up a little bit. If you've got a serious problem that doesn't work, there is a product. You either, you either buy a new needle or you use a product called a sharpener. And what this does is it's got four different whetstones that are at the specific taper 
for whatever airbrush you've got. Uh, I believe Badger, Iwata, and Harder and Steenbeck use the same taper. The Pache and the Vilblis uh, airbrushes use a different taper. So you, if you've got any of those airbrushes, you've got to make sure that you get the proper one. But basically, you just start by pushing it in all the way to the back, and it'll do kind of a coarse stone there. Spin it a few times, push it in again on the next one, and on down the line until it'll actually polish the, the, the tip of your airbrush. Uh, and then it comes with a 3,000 grit piece of sandpaper. And you can do any fine, fine polishing either by hand, uh, which I prefer, or some people will try to chuck this into a drill and then do it that way. The, pro, the reason why I don't use a drill with it is there's, that's a, a really sharp pointed object that's spinning around in a drill. And I've seen them bend uh, just from the, the, uh, the force of it spinning around like that and ruin needles, et, et cetera. Or if it, it breaks off, it's going to stab you. I, so I, I avoid that. I just do it by hand. This, uh, the Sharpen Air product, uh, it's, I don't know, it's somewhere around $50, I think, which is quite a cost savings when you consider each needle, uh, depending on the maker, they're anywhere from $15 to about $30, $40, something like that, and then plus shipping if you've got to, got to worry about it. Um, as far as where to get all of this kind of stuff, I get all of my Iwata parts from a uh, guy named Tom Grossman down in Colorado Springs at tagteamhobbies.com. My Harder and Steenbeck products, I get all of that from uh, Jesse Garcia at uh, uh, garagekitscolors.us. I think that's his website. Uh, but look up Garage Kit Colors. He, uh, he also has a line of paint, so that's, that's why he has that. And then anything I need uh, from a badger, I actually go direct to badger at US Airbrush Supply. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, one of the things I absolutely love about Badger is they stand by their products without any trouble whatsoever. Um, I've, I've got a friend of mine that had a, had a very old compressor that uh, broke on him, and he called them to get parts for it. They didn't actually have parts anymore, but they sold him a, a new compressor at a very steep discount. Uh, I have never seen customer service out of any company like I've seen out of Badger. They are fantastic. That's one reason why I'm so pleased that Reaper went with, uh, with Badger for this Vex. I know that this is going to be a, a well-cared-for and well-supported brush for years to come. All right, air sources. Now I'm going to switch cameras because this is the hand-wavy part of the presentation. And while I'm switching, we got any questions in the chat yet? Okay. Either that means nobody's interested or I'm answering everything they need. I guess that's a uh, good, bad, good sign, bad sign. Let me get ahead of that. Uh, that get, let me get ahead of that light so that I, I don't uh, have an uh, artifact on the lens. So air sources. The, the main thing that you want out of an air source is you want it constant and you want it dry. Uh, you can use an air tank or you can use a compressor to supply, supply that air. I started out in an apartment and I, so I used an air tank. I used a, a, a tank that uh, you use for pumping up car tires and things like that. I think I got it at Walmart for, I don't know, 20 bucks or so, 15, 20 bucks. This was years ago, so it's probably increased in price since then. You could pump it up to about 120 PSI and then carry that in. I'd go down and pump it up at the gas station, and then I'd carry it into the, the apartment and use it, use it that way. It would last two, three sessions a, a, at a time. It worked pretty well. I'd put a moisture trap and a, and a regulator on it. Uh, invariably, uh, again, it would die at about 3 o'clock in the morning, and there was nothing I could do about it, so I ended up buying two of them. And that, again, that worked out real well. I'd just rotate the one out and, and carry on. It would, it would get me through whatever it was that I was, I was trying to paint for that session. Then after I moved uh, into a house, uh, I needed to re redo the basement in there, so I ended up buying a, a very large two-stage air compressor, you know, huge tank and everything like that. And it, was, it, it ran great. It, it gave, of course, it would give me all the air that I would need. Um, but the, the problem with that is that the, I would be out there airbrushing in the garage, and then the compressor would start up to fill up the tank, and it would scare me half to death. So I'd be sitting there painting, and all of a sudden, blah! And I'd, I'd end up ruining whatever paint job it was that I... I was working on. It also was kind of dirty. I had to put a couple of different filters on the, on the airline. It was an oil filled compressor and every now and then oil from an air tool or, or something like that that I was using on the basement would, uh, would get into the airline and cause problems that way. Uh, so 
the way I solved that noise problem was I eventually finished the workshop that I was building in the basement with the remodel, and I just ran 200 feet worth of air hose from the, the garage down into the, into the workshop and used that for a couple of years. It was great. The neighbors still got annoyed at, at 2 in the morning when the compressor would kick on, but eh, what are you going to do, right? Then eventually I, I ended up moving out of that house, uh, and I moved to Denver, and my wife, since I had to leave that compressor there, uh, my wife ended up buying me a silent compressor. Uh, and I've still got this one. It's, a, it's an Iwata Smart Jet Pro. I'm going to show what I can of it. It's here on my bench. And I don't know if you've been able to hear it or not uh, on, the, on the stream. I've, I've been told that, that uh, you really can't hear it at all. It's about as noisy as a refrigerator. Uh, in fact, there's my tile that's on top of it with that sharp and air. Um, the things you want to look for in a, comp in a compressor is uh, if, you're, if you're anywhere that uh, you've got people around uh, is noise and then uh, moisture traps and regu regulators on it. So as, as I said, this is about as noisy as a refrigerator, so it's quite quiet. Um, I can be spraying and somebody can be uh, above me or even next to me. I can listen to music, uh, people talking, whatever, and nobody can hear it. It does have a built-in moisture trap right there. And we live in, in Denver, and so it is a, a fairly dry area. And in fact, I'm not going to really have much in the way of, way of water in there at all, even over the last couple of days of using this thing. It does need to be drained every so often, but just not very often at all. Um, does have a very fine regulator in here. You lift it up, and you can move it in about, uh, about a half a pound increments with the, the, the gauge that's right there. Uh, it is a tankless compressor, and what that means is, is that it's just the compressor, no tank to, to fill. Um, the, a compressor will always give a little bit of pulse to the airline. Uh, just that piston moving back and forth induces a bit of a pulse. And so the way Iwata and other makers fix that is they put a long hose that goes between the, the uh, compressor itself and the regulator water trap area. And it kind of kind of acts as a bit of a mini tank to try to absorb some of those pulses. And it works, works quite well. Um, and then I have a, a longer hose as well that actually goes over to my airbrush over here. I've got about, uh, about an eight foot hose or so, even though this thing's only about a foot and a half from, from my airbrushing station. I've got a nice long hose. Uh, it, as you heard, it only runs when I've actually got the, the airbrush open. Uh, so it doesn't generate a, a lot of heat. Uh, and it, so it lasts for an awful long time. I've had this, this uh, particular air, airbrush compressor. I've had it about 15 years, and I've never put a, a bit of money into it as, as far as maintenance. In fact, I only found out a couple of months ago that there's a filter in there that I need to change. I haven't done it yet. I, I didn't even know there was one. Uh, it is a little on the expensive side, but you're going to get what you pay for. I think that was around three, three fifty, something like that. Um, and it, again, it's a Smart Jet Pro. The smart part is the 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 bit where it, it turns on and off as it's being used to try to save some of that heat and wear and tear on the unit. Uh, and of course, you can get larger compressors. You can get smaller compressors. My daughter uh, won at Wonderfest a uh, uh, the Teen Award. And sponsored by Iwata, actually. And she actually won a, uh, a Ninja Jet compressor. This is just a little tabletop compressor. It, it works very, very well, too. It's a little bit noisier than, than my Smart Jet. Um, but again, for demonstrations at cons, things like that, it's, it's really quite good. The uh, uh, one bad thing is it doesn't, well, two, a couple of bad things I'll show you, is it doesn't have an actual regulator. It's got a, a plus or a minus on here. Uh, so you got to kind of do it by feel, which... After you've been doing it, uh, using your airbrush for a little while, you'll pick up without any trouble, but it's just a little bit intimidating right off the bat. Uh, it also has a long hose as an effort to try to absorb those pulses, and it, it does a pretty good job. Every now and then after, uh, after it starts getting a little hot, uh, it does have a thermal shutdown in it, but it, but it runs constantly, so it does get, get pretty, pretty hot. Every now and then after it get, starts getting pretty hot, you start seeing a bit of a pulse in the line. Uh, it does not have a built-in moisture trap, and so I've got a pistol grip moisture trap on it. The idea behind that is that any of your airbrushes, it's just in front of my quick disconnect, you end up putting that on your, on your airbrush. Now you're filtering right at the, uh, the intake of your airbrush, so you know that it's going to be 
be filtered, and then it kind of fits in your hand a little bit better and is able to uh, to to give you a little bit better grip of your your airbrush. If you've only got the one, then you the one airbrush, then you don't need these quick disconnects, and you can actually move this up higher, and it's even uh, it'd be up in here, be even a better grip. Then. Uh, I just saw a note, uh, my chat popped up. I'm not looking at the chat, so uh, John, I'm going to need you to, to read anything that's yeah, in the Zoom you got chat. It. I'm on it. If there's any questions in there. Um, let's see, where was I? Oh, with that, that pistol grip filter. Um, I didn't in my class, I had a couple of people ask me about alternate grips. They, if they've got arthritis issues or uh, missing digits, things like that. Um, basically, try to hold it the way you would hold a pencil. Uh, be, just because that's going to give you your best control on it. Um, if you notice, there's a little bit of fat right there on your finger. So you want to use that as, as the way you push down on your, on your trigger. You, uh, you don't want to actually use the, the front of your finger because after a few minutes, that's going to be very fatiguing on you and you're going to end up doing a little bit of a shake and, and cause problems that way. So just try to use the fat of your finger if you can. If you're missing digits, you can, you can do an overhand hold, I'll do it backwards here, where you, you grip it like that and then use your thumb to do it. Same rules apply. You've got the, the little fat pad of your thumb that fits right there. You even notice each trigger on every airbrush, this is on the VEX, has got a little indentation. The fat pad of your finger actually fits there. On my Harder and Steenbeck, or I'm sorry, on my, yeah, on my Iwata, it's actually a little dished area uh, right over the front of the trigger. Anyway, so, so there's, there's a couple of different alternate grips on there. There's also airbrushes out there that actually ha are a trigger style where they've got a pistol, uh, a pistol trigger right here instead of a, a trigger up here. And so you squeeze that to start the air and the flow of the paint. And it, it, uh, they work really, really well. I've, I've only ever used one. It's made by the Grex Corporation. Uh, it, and it, it really worked well. It, it, it was very easy to control because you've got your entire hand over everything instead of kind of trying to be off balance a little bit, you're, you're using your entire hand. Um, also, when I'm trying to be very precise on something, I, I end up using both hands uh, and also do uh, what, I, what I generally call sniper breathing. You know, you kind of breathe in and then as you're, as you're spraying, just kind of exhale slowly and it'll, it'll help you stay steady. Um, one of the things that'll help you stay steady is always keep your air on. Always, always keep your air on. Here, I'm going to show you a couple of things real quick. Yeah, we have we have a few questions whenever we get a chance. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, somebody asked siphon feed versus gravity feed, or fed. Okay, so as I showed, my side bottle is set up to do, uh, you can do both. So gravity feed... Uh, generally, since it relies on gravity to, to drop the, the paint into the front of the airbrush, you want to use thinner paints, inks, uh, very thin paints, etc. Uh, a siphon feed, it's got a couple of advantages there. One is that it, they're made to, to uh, siphon the air directly up. It uses air pressure to, to bring the air up like a straw does. Uh, the nice thing about that is that you can actually attach your bottle directly to it and spray, dire spray directly out of the bottle. Uh, a lot of people that do production line, like air uh, t-shirts at fairs and things like that, they've got a whole bunch of siphon feed airbrushes. And so to, just to change colors, they just pop this out and then just pop in a new color and away they go. There's no, there's no uh, mess or anything like that. These are, these are generally a little, little bit thicker paints to go up here. So you do need a little bit more air pressure. Uh, and also when you're, you're airbrushing a t-shirt, you want a higher air pressure anyway, just to be able to get that, that particulate uh, into the fibers of the airbrush. And when I say higher air pressure, I'm talking 50, 60, 70 PSI. Uh, in fact, it's, it's more than that uh, smart jet will do that. That smart jet tops out at around 35 PSI or so. Awesome. Um, and then one, we have three more, but I'm going to do this one first. It says, I have a problem with my airbrush where it will stop spraying paint for a moment and then shoot out a bunch of paint. And then he says, what am I doing wrong? So that's going to be sputtering. Uh, that, there's a couple of different things with that. Generally, generally it's a clog of some sort. Uh, the, the other is an air source that isn't steady. Or, again, things aren't, aren't completely tight. You've got an air leak up here in the front 
or or a, a clog or something along the, those lines, or even a uh, an air leak back here where there's an uh, there's like O-rings and stuff like that. Let me show you on the hardware and steam back easily. There's O-rings and seals. Uh, that's a little Teflon seal up there. And if those get worn down, you're going to end up having sputtering. But uh, first, check your paint. Um, if it's either not thin enough or if there's a, a, a larger particulates that will cause a clog, you may need to strain your paints. A um, couple of air, a couple of lines of paint that I've had problems with that I've had to strain out. Uh, one is Vallejo. Uh, they, they work really, really well, but just every now and then they, they just clump, seem to clump up a little bit. Um, I have not had that problem with Reaper. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I've only started spraying your Reaper in the last couple of, couple of weeks, and I'll get into how I thin that. But uh, I haven't had any problem with Reaper, and I haven't had any problem with paints that are already made for airbrushes. Uh, so just check your paints. Uh, and um, uh, Tamiya and Gunze have also had problems with them, them clumping up, and they need to be strained a little bit. You can actually get funnels that have little tiny coffee strainers in them, and so you pour the paint out uh, into that funnel into, a, into another container. Uh, I'm sure this is going to come up later, but uh, it says, do you find you need any particular considerations with the lower humidity or elevation in the Denver area? Yes, I do. And I will get into that. I'll get into that when uh, uh, doing okay, uh, uh, the paint thinning things. I end up using what's called retarder. Perfect. And there we go. I, I knew we were probably going to get to it because I've, I've seen the class before, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. No worries at all. Um, okay. So actually let's, let's switch into that. If, uh, if we're done with air sources, uh, that seems to, to, uh, I think we've taken up all of that. Um, so thinning a paint, like I said, you want it to go to about 2% milk and let me move that down there. And Whenever I thin paint, this is a, a, some Reaper paint that I tested out to, to try to spray. Uh, it's like polished bone or something like that. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Reaper paint, Vallejo, uh, a lot of those, those other uh, paints that are really good for brush painting are, are fairly thick. And to get it down to about 2% milk, you want to, to, to do a, a thinning job on it. The best products to use for thinning is something with a flow improver in it. Uh, Reaper makes one, Vallejo makes one. I use a product from Liquitex, um, Golden makes one. There's all kinds of different things. Basically what they are is when you're adding water to your, your paint, it's gonna, gonna thin it out. And, but water itself is, technically it's a little bit on the viscous side. And if you ever look at a glass of water, you can, all, you can see that there's always kind of a little, little curve in that, that glass at, at the surface tension area where the water actually meets the side of the size of the glass. It's, uh, that's called a meniscus. And so they, they add into flow improver a surfactant of some sort uh, to uh, make that water wetter, for lack of a better term. And so it actually gets in there and it's able to thin the, the pigments and the binder a little bit better and just make it flow better. If you've got a really thick paint, that you need more than about 25% or so thinning to get it to be able to, to uh, uh, spray, you may start running into adhesion problems because you're gonna be re uh, removing so much of that binder, thinning out that binder that actually holds the paint, uh, the, the paint pigment onto whatever it is that you're spraying. So when, the, when that happens, you end up replacing it with a medium. And where did I put my medium? Oh, here it is. What a medium is, is uh, this one's made by Golden. Uh, other companies make them. Uh, matte varnish uh, on, on Reaper is very close to a, to a medium. Uh, uh, and so you can use it for that too. Basically all it is, is just the binder that's suspended in the same carrier that your paint's going to use. Uh, Golden's uh, seems to be able to, to be compatible with Reaper, Vallejo, a few others like that. Um, I haven't run into any issues with, with acrylic-based paints and uh, uh, Golden stuff. Uh, it, it does look like it's white, um, and that's just the, the, the carrier that will actually uh, evaporate off, and so this is completely colorless, colorless. It doesn't shift the color of your paint at all. However, when you're using this much binder in there, it will uh, make your paint a little bit more transparent. And actually, sometimes that's, that's what an effect you're looking for. I use an awful lot of transparent paints nowadays as uh, glazing methods. Uh, some uh, very, various other colors to try to knock back something or, or pull it forward or, or shift the color just a little bit. I, I use an awful lot of transparents. Look for the keywords that you want to look for is either medium 
or extender, uh, something along those lines. You can find that at, at, at pretty much any art supply store. Or, or like I say, a Reaper's Matte Varnish works as well too. So if you've got, if you've got that. Then we started talking about tip dry. Uh, what happens, let's see if I can show it on here, is what happens is your, your needle and your nozzle right there at that, that point, if there's any sort of imperfection or a, a little paint clog or something like that, that's gonna give a spot for that paint to actually adhere to and it'll stay there and you'll end up getting, getting little boogers of paint that stick on the end there. And that's called tip dry. And in the Denver area, we get them an awful lot. Anywhere that, that's, that's very dry, uh, spraying acrylics, they're horrible for that. And so what you do is you end up using a retarder product. And uh, Reaper makes one. In fact, I, I think it's actually called the retarder. Um, I'm not entirely sure. But Liquitex uh, also makes one. This is called Slow Dry. Uh, Golden makes one. There's a lot of different products out there. I, I honestly don't know what the chemical is that, that makes this uh, uh, make your paint dry a little bit slower, but it, it changes it from uh, seconds to minutes in the Denver area. Um, so you only use a little bit. I only use about a drop of, t uh, of this stuff uh, per, per about half a bottle here. So uh, this thing, I'd only use a couple of drops of this, this uh, slow dry. Uh, as you can tell, I've still got quite, well, maybe you can't really tell. As you can tell, I've still got um, a little bit left in here. I've had this bottle about 10 years. So you can see that you don't, you don't you need to use it very, mu very much of it. I only use a, a drop or two at a time. So you do not have problems if you're wanting to spray things that are not acrylics, uh, like enamels or lacquers or urethanes, things like that. You generally don't run into tip dry problems, uh, especially oil-based enamels. They're going to be a little bit slipperier. And, and if they do end up running into tip dry, then, you, then uh, it, it doesn't happen nearly as often. Um, as, far as, as far as how to get rid of the booger, that's on there. If you've got your crown cap on there, then you don't want to just kind of reach in and, and pull it off. It's, it's really easy to bend that little, that little nozzle up there, that little uh, needle. And so I end up getting micro brushes. They're uh, just kind of a little dental brush. Soak it in cleaner and just kind of wipe it around the inside there. Just, just be very, very gentle with it. And just kind of wipe around the, in, the inside there and that'll get it out of there. Another couple of things to, to worry about with cleaning a brush uh, is you actually want to use an actual cleaner rather than a thinner. This is uh, just an easy uh, product from Easy Air that you mix uh, eight to one with water. I wear contacts, and so these are just old contact uh, fluid containers that I just fill up with this stuff. Um, the difference between a cleaner and a thinner is the cleaner is made to eat the binder that your paint uses, and so it'll actually almost, it's a solvent and almost scrape it from the inside here. It's a lot more aggressive for it. The, the problem with that though, is that you don't want to actually leave your cleaner in there. So if you do use a cleaner, yeah, let's do it on the backs. If you do use a cleaner, you want to put in just a little bit. I usually do oh, about a half a cap or so. Uh, and the, the reason, the reason about a half of half a, uh, a, a color cup is that I go back in here with a with a brush and I just kind of kind of swirl it around maybe you know you can see some dried paint on here I might go in and kind of attack that a little bit and just kind of kind of hit it and then I've got a color cup or a uh, spray out pot right here and it's got a little filter right there basically you just put the front end of the the airbrush in it and then spray it out and you can just kind of watch watch the amount of uh, uh, cleaner go out there. Uh, sometimes I'll, while, I'm, while I'm spraying, I'll just kind of spin it and try to agitate it a little bit, see if that'll help it out. And then after I'm, I'm done with that, I'll spray one or two of those, and then I'll just take some tap water, again, in a, uh, in a little contact bottle, and I'll just put it in there. And then I'll just spray out a couple of the, these full of, full of tap water in an effort to, uh, to get it to to clean out that cleaner so that it doesn't stay in attack. Since this is a solvent, uh, there we go. Since this is a solvent, it, it can attack the O-rings, it can attack the finish, et, et cetera, on the inside of your airbrush. Um, and so you, you really don't want to leave any of that. 
in there. And so I just end up cleaning it out. What will happen if you do leave it, especially with more caustic chemicals, this is the uh, uh, color cup to my Iwata, and you can see that it's eaten the chrome uh, on the inside there. I think I, I either uh, used an ammonia-based cleaner or something along those lines, and I left it in there a little bit uh, longer than I should have. It, it hasn't affected the usage of it any, but there's now uh, little micro areas that paint can attach to and scratches and things, and so it's a, it's a little bit harder to clean. Um, and again, that's on, on like this older airbrush where the inside of it's brass. And when you take it apart, you're going to have little wear areas, things like that. As, as they age, you're just going to end up getting a little bit looser in there. And so you've got to replace your O-rings and uh, uh, things like that. Um, th this hasn't gotten to the point where, where I can't use it, though. It still, still runs just, just like the day that I got it. Um, so even if it's a little bit worn out in there, you're not going to have any problems. You don't need to strip it down on every session. You can just do that color cleaning uh, and, then, and then leave it. I, uh, I only strip my, my airbrushes down, oh, I don't know, probably once every five to seven sessions, basically whenever I start having a problem with it. Uh, just because that's a wear item. Uh, every time you pull it apart, you're going to wear things down just a little bit. Um, so I, I don't strip them down very often at all. I try not to, to get in there. There's a few other products you can use to uh, help clean it out when it's, when it's extremely dirty. Um, there's there's kind of some, some argument back and forth on, on using products like some of these pipe cleaner brushes, things like that. Again, uh, if, if you're putting this into your brush, the needle's in here, so I'm not going to be able to go through. But if, you, if you're putting this through your brush to try to scrape things out in an effort to clean it, uh, the, there's some thought that, that this might scratch a little bit. That's probably true. I, uh, I just dip this into a little bit of cleaner and just be very, very careful with it. Um, again, since I don't strip my airbrushes down very often, just a little bit of, of uh, usage on these, I haven't had any problems. Um, I've also used these little interdental cleaners. They've got a plastic tip on here so they won't scratch. And they can go into the, the little bit tighter areas. Uh, like if you've got a stuck nozzle or something like that, they can kind of, kind of help clean it out, et cetera. Um, but again, I've been using, I, I bought this as part of a Badger cleaning kit at the same time I got this Iwata. So I've been using this for, again, 15 years, and I haven't had any problems with it. It'll probably make it eventually wear out, but... 15 years, this, this airbrush doesn't owe me anything. Uh, if you've got a really, really tough uh, uh, job that you need to clean out on it, you can use an ultrasonic cleaner. The uh, problems with that is that you want to make sure that you use just water. If you use any sort of a caustic chemical, it can, it can strip the chrome off, things like that. And so I just, I, I do have one, and I, I've used it a couple of times when there's just something that I can't get out of the inside of the nozzle, or I'm lazy, or something along those lines. I'll just fill it with some water, throw that in there, and then let it go for about five minutes or so, and then pull it back out. Um, I have thrown this body in there uh, once when I had, a, uh, I had an O-ring failure and I ended up getting paint back up in here. Um, I just needed to get it cleaned out. You do want to take the air valve off before you put it in the water uh, and, and get as many O-rings and other seals out of there as you possibly can because they can swell or uh, get stuck, things like that uh, if you've got problems. But make sure you always pull that air valve out if you ever, if you ever soak your airbrush in, in water. And don't soak it in anything else. There's no reason to throw it in lacquer, uh, lacquer thinner or anything like that. Just, just use water. Nothing more caustic than that. Because uh, if, you, if you've got a little imperfection in here, that cleaner is just going to be like a drill. And it's going to pop your chrome off or, or something along those lines. It gets really nasty. Yeah, I was just about to ask. Somebody asked about Simple Green, but then you said just water. So you got that yep. one <laughs> right at the yep. right time. Yep, just water. Just water. Um, a lot of people uh, just leave their color caps open. Personally, I use the lids on, on my airbrushes. Um, I don't, ju uh, for this demonstration, just because uh, I've been showing back and forth what's going on. But most of your color cups actually come with, well, that's not that right lid here. Most of your color cups end up coming with lids that'll fit on there uh, to, to seal it up. The, uh, the thing is, is that if you do end up having tip dry or something like that that causes a bubble back there, it'll stop the bubble from, from popping and, and throwing 
paint everywhere. Um, it also helps if you're tipping it or something along those lines to uh, keep for the, the paint from, from, from uh, dumping it out. The, uh, the Vex even comes with a, with a paint, uh, with a lid on it too. So just use that. You can notice there's a little hole in the tops of the lids. That's how, uh, as paint level goes down, it replaces that with air to uh, keep everything equalized. So make sure that you don't get any, uh, any paint uh, into, those, uh, into those holes and all, the, and all of your lids end up having them. Keep that clean. All right, now let's get into some safety stuff. Your lungs, let me just hook that on so that I know where it is. Your lungs were really only designed to ever breathe one thing, and that's air. And so if you end up getting a lot of particulate in, in the air, then you end up breathing that in, and it can, it can end up coating your lungs, things like that. And you just get one particle in, into the right spot in your lung, you end up getting a fibroid right there, and that's a good step to cancer. So just don't do that. Uh, so do everything we can to avoid that. Um, one, there, there's a couple of couple of ways to to fix this. The first one is control. You you don't need to hold the airbrush this far away from where you're spraying something. If you use lower pressure and get in a little bit closer to where you're at, you're not going to have nearly as much overspray. Because if you're back here, you're having to really hose the paint on there to actually even reach that kind of distance and still stay wet enough, especially in the Denver area. Uh, you know, if you spray back here, your paint's almost going to be dry by the time it hits, hits your object over here. So just get in nice and close and be a, be a lot more gentle and smooth. Uh, I started to go over some of the, the things with grip on trying to be smooth. The other things I do is I keep the air on all the time, like I said, and just pull the trigger back nice and easy. And as you're, as you're spraying something, you hold the, the, the trigger, just go back ni nice and slowly, and don't snap it back. Don't just release the trigger. Always push it back and just be nice and smooth with it. Always keep that air going on. Just kind of get into a zen state of mind, a nice good flow. Uh, something that helps me to do that is I put on movie soundtracks. Uh, something that has a nice, some quiet areas and then kind of some some uh, louder dynamic areas and crescendo and stuff because then you can kind of get, get into that that flow. Um, I don't put on, on music with the words in it uh, because then the voices in my head end up singing along and I lose track of where it is that I'm that I'm doing. Uh, so I just always use use movie soundtracks. They're they're kind of designed to to have a nice flow to them to to get things going. Um, uh, I, I personally like the Hunt for Red October uh, soundtrack. That, that seems to always work for me or any of the Star Trek uh, soundtracks. Um, I try to avoid uh, too much with James Horner just because it's always got the blah. Uh, and and it's a lot of his later soundtracks and that, that just always kind of uh, sets me off. Uh, the other thing is if it's late enough in the day, have a slug of scotch or a glass of wine or something like that and just kind of take the edge off of the day and, and, and just relax a little bit. Uh, don't get any more than that because otherwise you're going to be all over the place. But just, you know, don't, don't drink and, and spray. Just, just, just one. Just kind of relax a little bit. Uh, okay, so then that, as far as, as far as that, the first one is just be easy on it. The next is a mask, a spray mask. Now, this is a half-face respirator, uh, and you can get them at Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever. You want to look for one that's called a P100 rated. What the P stands for, we're all familiar with N95 masks. What the N or the P stands for is what type of, of uh, carrier carriers it's designed to block. N is designed to block water, uh, water-based carriers. P is designed to block water and oil-based carriers. Uh, so if you've got other enamel paints, things like that, it will, block, it will block this. The number after that is how efficient that filter is. An N95 is 95% efficient. A P100 is 99.5, I believe. I think it's 99.5% efficient. Uh, just because nothing is 100%. So even though they call it a 100, it's still 95. I don't have any facial hair, so I, I can use a, a half face like that. If you've got a lot of facial hair, then they make respirators uh, that are, they look more like a, a scuba uh, regulator, and you kind of bite on them, and then you've got a, a thing that you pinch your nose on. Those work really well, too. Uh, they they kind of work as a, a ring that goes around the, the back of your neck, and then the, the intake is back here. They, they work really well, too. I used to have a, a fairly large beard, and that's what I, that's what I ended up uh, using back then. But anyway, when you put... When you put on a respirator, first thing you want to do is you want to breathe in while covering the filters. And what that'll do is as 
as you go in, it'll suck down on your face, and you can feel if there's any leaks or, or air holes or anything like that along there in that suction. And if there is, then you can try to, try to fix it. If, uh, there, I, I don't know if there's any lubricant that you put on here that doesn't attack. I know you don't want to use Vaseline just because it'll, it'll attack, but, uh, uh, attack the, the, the mask material. But you can just kind of adjust it a little bit. Some of the better masks have got multiple adjustment points on the front and the back. Um, I think this mask was around probably around 50 bucks or so. Um, and it's, it's fairly long in the tooth, but replace these filters fairly often. I think I replace my filters about every six months. Um, if you've got a different sized face, this is my daughter's mask. Uh, so it's, it's a lot smaller mask uh, to, to fit her face. Uh, and, oh, and you can store them. I've got this out, but uh, you can store them. You should store them in a plastic bag uh, to keep air from circulating around in it. With the, the filters are actually designed to circulate air, and they do wear out. So if you can keep them in an airless, uh, as much of an airless environment as you can, they will last longer. Um, but I, I replace them about every six months. I don't know if I, I need to replace them more often than that, or I'm sorry, less often than that. Um, I just figure it's cheap insurance for the, the one set of lungs that I've got. And then the other thing is, is you can get a spray booth. And I've got a booth right here. Let me change to my next camera. I've got a uh, booth that's uh, fairly large that you can see. It's made out of uh, uh, galvanized uh, sheet metal. I've had this for about 15 years, too. Um, and it's got a 350 CFM fan in the back. And you can see there's just a furnace filter there to, uh, to catch what any large particulate there is. Uh, but it's, it's a squirrel cage explosion proof uh, motor. So I can, I can spray uh, some fairly strong stuff. Normally I have this ducted to the outside, uh, but I've, I've recently moved and I just haven't uh, uh, been able to get a hole in the wall yet and get it ducted. So what I've done here is it goes to a dryer duct and then down into this bucket. And we call this a booth bong. Uh, my, my model club came up with this. And what it is, is basically there's a couple of inches of water at the bottom of that. And that, uh, that vent duct goes all the way down to almost touching the water. It's probably about a half inch away or so. And the air blows down into that. The particulates hit that water and get trapped. And then, of course, there's also a bunch of furnace filters in there and then some charcoal filters on the exhaust. We, uh, make sure that you cut the holes for the exhaust to be a little bit larger than the, uh, than the intake, and then you don't have any back pressure. Um, I think there's about five or six uh, one-inch holes in there, something like that. That'll, uh, and that, between the carbon, fi uh, carbon filters and the furnace filters, that seems to trap most of the particulate uh, that comes out. I don't spray anything really nasty uh, with that, since it is in a house. I do, I do open up, up the window. I do not have it ducted out the window, uh, just because I live in the basement, or live, I work in the basement down here. Sometimes it feels like I live down here. But I, I work down in the basement, and so all it would do is just spray into the win or uh, spray the air into the window well, and it'd just come back into the house no matter how well I, I had a piece of wood to try to block that. Um, but I, I just haven't ducted it to the outside yet. It's on my round to it list, but there's always something else to be done. Uh, my previous house, uh, I ended up buying a new furnace, and I paid the, the guy 50 bucks to duct my spray booth out the uh, old combustion air intake. On, on my old furnace, the, the new one didn't need it. And so they were gonna be removed anyway. So I just had him duct that on out. Uh, and it, that worked really well, because it was a nice big eight inch pipe. I had no back pressure or anything like that. I could take two cans of spray paint and stand back here and it would all get sucked in and go away. It was wonderful. I missed that. But I'll get there again. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's a, the, the ways to protect your lungs. Um, if you're gonna be spraying anything nasty, enamels, uh, urethanes, things like that. Just do that outside if you can't get yourself a good spray booth. Uh, there are some really cheap spray booths you can find on Amazon for about 70 bucks. They're about yay big, and they've got a small hose that ends in a uh, kind of a narrow thing, and the idea of that is you actually shut it in the window, and they, they work really well. We use those at, uh, at our hobby shop when we meet. Um, like I say, they're about $70 or so. They're not very big, but if you're only spraying minis, they're perfect for that. I do also wear gloves. 
I just have a, a box of nitrile gloves that I get from Costco. Uh, come to a, th a three pack and uh, I do end up wearing gloves. Um, when you're spraying acrylics, you don't, I don't really so much worry about the, the actual chemicals on, on my skin. This just makes cleanup that much easier. I don't end up looking like a, a gut leprosy or something like that because I got colors all over here. Um, but uh, if I'm spraying like enamels or, or things along those lines, then I definitely wear, wear these because you, you, you know, paint thinner on your fingers, et cetera. You can absorb all of that through the skin. Uh, let's see. I think that's about it on safety. Have we had any questions, John, on, on that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, there's one from other, uh, along the lines of safety. It says, uh, how long before it is generally safe for someone or pets to enter the studio area after you've sprayed acrylics? You know, what I do is uh, in here, even with my, my booth filter and all of that kind of stuff, I, I just have the door right here and I just leave it shut the rest of the evening. Um, it, so it's probably a couple of hours at least, but uh, I'm lucky in that I've got my own workshop area. Nobody else comes in here. And so I just, I just seal it off. Nobody comes in. I just have it for the rest of the night. Um, I, some people uh, just end up leaving the, their booth running. And I've done that. I just let it sit there and circulate the air in, in through that filter. And I've noticed I don't have any odor when I come in after about an hour or so. A lot of it just depends on how, uh, how much air your booth can move um, and then the volume of the, the room that you're in. Nice. Um, and then along the safety, there's really no, no other ones. Um, I know that we're probably going to get into thinning and things like that. There was a good question about uh, metallics. Um, it says, does the metallic flake mess with the airbrush uh, or any advice on airbrushing with metallic paint? Okay. So that, that's a really good point. Yeah. I, I actually ended up skipping that when I was talking about uh, uh, thinning paint. So, so metallics, the, the couple of tricks that you want to do with metallics is one, I've never found a good acrylic metallic that sprays. And maybe that's just because I live in the Denver area, um, but a metallic, it's got particles in there. And when it hits the, the material that you're, you're painting, you want those particles to lay down nicely so that they can be somewhat reflective or whatever uh, thing that you're looking for. Especially if it's trying to get like a mirror chrome finish, you want those particles to, as the carrier uh, evaporates, you want the, the particles to lay down almost perfectly on that, that surface. And that's how you get that, that mirror finish. Uh, in the Denver area on acrylics, anytime I've tried to spray metals, uh, just the, the, the amount of time that it takes the, the, from leaving the airbrush to impacting the, the object that I'm painting, they just seem to dry out too much uh, to be able to, to really have a good surface. It, it always ends up being a little bit pebbly, never just super smooth. Um, so I only spray enamels when I'm spraying um, metallics. And uh, the product that I use uh, is made by Allclad, A-L-C-L-A-D. Uh, that's really the, the only metallic that I've found that works really well. I've always been looking for a better metallic and everything that I've, I've looked for. I've, I've just never found anything as good as an Allclad. It's very nasty. Uh, it's it, it's a, a nasty enamel, so I got to do it outside. Um, so I ended up taking a couple of non-metallic metallic, metallic uh, classes at ReaperCon, uh, trying to figure out how to, how to get that effect without actually using metallics. Um, and you also spray that at very low pressure. Uh, and again, the idea is very low pressure. Those particulate uh, aren't going to be moving very fast, and so it's going to uh, have that time to actually lay down and, and uh, uh, evaporate on its own time and, and get a nice mirrored finish. And when I say low pressure, I'm talking under 10 PSI. I think, I think most people spray them at around eight. Uh, so at very, very low pressure. And also metallics will, will eat your needle and your nozzle because it's, it's again, it's a, it's a particulate that's going through there. And so it's almost going to be like sandpaper etching everything away. And so what I do is I use my old airbrush, my old Awada, airbrush uh, with a larger needle and nozzle uh, to be able to pass that particular little bit easier. It's got a 0.5 in it right now and uh, just allow that particulate to pass, pass through easier. And then the, the needle and nozzle I actually mark as uh, for metallics only. And so I don't use it for anything else and just let it end up etching away. Um, and then other questions that I think pretty much all got answered. There was uh, something about uh, possible dried paint chunks or something like that, maybe in the tip of the dropper bottle. Um, people in chat were talking about filtering them, and I think you mentioned the filter as well, the little thing. Yeah, so my, Micromark is the company that makes those little funnels that uh, uh, have the, the 
little filter in them. Uh, and so what I do is I never thin. Uh, the other tricks are is I never thin inside the actual bottle of paint. I end up buying, I end up buying bottles on Amazon. Um, I think I get like 50 for like 10 bucks or something like that. They're really cheap. Uh, and then I just end up squirting whatever the, the paint is that I need into here and then adding my, uh, my thinners and, and my flow improvers and, and uh, mediums and such into that. The, the, the other reason to do it outside of the bottle is that every time you expose that paint to air, it's going to start catalyzing. And so the less you could, the less time you keep your original paint bottles open, the longer shelf life they're going to have. And so, and as soon as you start exposing, exposing the paint to anything that it wasn't designed to have originally, like flow improvers or mediums, et cetera, it can start catalyzing things. Uh, and you can end up getting chunks, things like that. So even, even after I, I do this kind of thing, uh, I'll still end up using a filter. Uh, filter funnel. I don't have any at hand right now. I, I couldn't find them. Um, but I, ju I just end up using those. Uh, and then also realize that I don't put the entire bottle into this. I only just a little bit at a time. And the reason for that is even, even if this is nicely sealed up and things, it'll still catalyze uh, after a couple of months. I've probably only got about two months of, of shelf life out, out, out of this. Um, so I just don't use very much at a time. Okay, perfect. I, um, I also oh, do use agitators. Um, I'll end up putting a little agitator in the uh, in the bottle. It's a little stainless steel. Make sure that it's stainless steel. Otherwise, you can have uh, 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 problems with the, the chrome coming off, something like that. A lot of the, the cheaper ball bearings that, uh, that you end up finding on Amazon are not not true stainless steel. Uh, look for surgical steel, uh, something along those lines, and then you can kind of guarantee that they're not going to come apart on you. I do also use a paint shaker a lot of times. It's a little thing uh, that you strap the paint into, and it just like the little Home Depot paint shakers, and it just goes back and forth. And so a lot of times I'll turn that thing on, and uh, uh, while I'm setting up the rest of my airbrush, and let that go for about 10, 30 se 10 to 15 seconds or so. Uh, Balrog John asks, uh, spraying, what about spraying uh, alcohol-based inks? The same rules apply. Uh, Alcohol-based inks, I spray those all the time, uh, like Jacquard and uh, Vallejo, et cetera. Uh, uh, even Copic uh, marker refills, I've sprayed those. Uh, as long as they're, they're nice and thin already, and they're, they're already dry uh, because of the alcohol. So you want to make sure that your, your airbrush itself is dry inside. If you've, if you've just done a color change and you've got some water in there, you want to make sure that everything is completely dry because otherwise the alcohol is going to react with the water and you'll end up getting sputtering problems, things like that. Um, but it's already thin. Uh, so I generally spray at a very low pressure uh, because otherwise it does dry out as well. I generally spray that stuff right around 10 PSI, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little bit more. Um, I guess one thing to, to think about when you're spraying these different, uh, different mediums is there's a kind of a triangle and there's paint viscosity, there's air pressure, and then distance to whatever it is that you're, you're spraying. And you want to be in the center of that triangle, uh, that, that little dot in the center. And so each, each time you change a variable on the edge of these triangles, it's going to try to move that dot up. And so you need to move the other two variables to try to compensate for moving that dot back down into the center of that. So as the uh, viscosity of your paint is going to change, you may need to change the, the uh, actual PSI that you're spraying with or how far away from, from whatever it is that you're spraying is. Uh, if uh, same same thing. If you're if you change the distance that you've got you, uh, between something, you may need to change the viscosity of your paint, either raise or lower, or uh, uh, the uh, pressure you're spraying at. Um, and that that's one reason why I don't have a lot of formulas. I'm a numbers guy, and so it, it drives me absolutely bonkers to not have a formula of well, I got to add two drops of this and one drop of that, things like that. It, but you got to do it by feel. Again, it's kind of a Zen thing. You just kind of relax and take it as it goes and just kind of, kind of be easy with it. And you'll, and you'll end up figuring it out that way. Yeah. That ties into third bad's question that says, what PCI would you use for primer uh, badger 105 and Vallejo primer? I know that it's going to come down. Yeah. To so a, a good starting point is right around 20 PSI. Uh, I, I, again, I, I know those, the, the numbers out there, um, but I, I spray uh, Vallejo primer. I spray Badger Steinel Res. I spray Gunze. Uh, I spray just about anything. And I start at 20 
and then I modulate from there. I either go up or I go down, depending on how thick it is. If it's something like Mr. Surfacer uh, 1200, where it's a little bit thicker, I'll have to go up in PSI and get a little, get get in. Um, but if it's uh, if it's something that is a little bit th thinner, like uh, Badger Steinel Res, I can maybe go down to around 18 PSI, something like that, or stay back a little bit farther. It's again, it's all. It's all playing with variables, but 20 PSI is, a, is kind of a number to start with and then modulate from there. A lot of people are saying the, the triangle was a great visual for them. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, it, it, uh, I had somebody explain it to me that way and it's stuck ever since. And so you know that you've got that target in the center and, and as the needle size changes, and this is all things, everything else being equal, as your needle size changes, that target that you got to hit is smaller and smaller. So you got to be more accurate with things. And so that's why I say, like my Harder and Steenbeck here, this is a German airbrush, and it's built like any other German automobile. It is very precise when it's tuned, when everything is perfect, there isn't anything around that can touch it. It's like a Porsche. But if something's a little off there, then I'm into the guardrails and I've exploded. And so that triangle really helps to, to think about things. Um, let's see, what else we've got? Oh, uh, there's also airbrush-ready paints. Golden makes them. Uh, Liquitex makes some. Uh, there's inks out there, um, et cetera. There's a company called Lifetone uh, makes them. Uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of different colors in here. This is a taxidermy paint company. Uh, and... Garage Kits US, let's see if I can find one, yeah. Again, Gar uh, Jesse Garcia out at Garage Kits US, there's paint all over this one because it leaked in my luggage. Uh, Garage Kits Colors US, Garage Kits US, something like that, sells these. Uh, and there, there's a whole bunch of colors if you don't want to mix them, they come in both opaques and transparents, and they're already set up to, to spray even in very small airbrushes. Uh, same thing with the Goldens, um, and they've, they've all got little dropper bottles, and they've got agitators already built in them. They've already got the flow improver, the medium, the tip dry, uh, uh, retarder to combat tip dry, everything you need. Um, I, and I've sprayed these all over the United States, and I've never had a problem with tip dry, whether it be in Colorado. I go to Kentucky every couple of years for Wonderfest. Uh, Atlanta, I, I've just never had any problems whatsoever uh, with these. So if you don't want to mess with the, the ratios and trying to worry about things, you can invest in, uh, in uh, colors here. Createx also makes some. Uh, the art, uh, the, the more art-oriented ones like Golden and such, they're going to come with more art-oriented colors, and so you may have to mix colors, uh, which has been kind of, kind of interesting. That st set me on about a four-year uh, quest on trying to understand color theory. Uh, and opaques and transparents and, and layering and some, how some of that stuff works. But uh, you can already get, get a lot of these already built into them. I don't think Reap, Reaper probably has no plans to, uh, to start an airbrush-ready line, which I wouldn't blame them. They're, they're one of the best for, for uh, hand brushing, and they know that and stick with it. Uh, I mean, there might be some announcements maybe in the future of Reaper panel coming up later tonight uh, during the closing ceremony, but... Uh, who knows, or or something for the future. We, we, we hey, you know, uh, if you need somebody to beta test any of those paints. <laughs> uh, we know a few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll, uh, as I was telling John before this started, I haven't painted a mini in about five years. Uh, and so ReaperCon kind of kicked me in the butt to try to try to start doing it. And I'd forgotten how much fun it is. Uh, I, I've been using an airbrush for so long. It's been a long time since I've used a hairbrush. And it, I, it Aside from, from watching my paint dry even on a wet palette here in, in Denver with 4% humidity, it's been an absolute ball. I have absolutely loved it. Um, and I've been, use, I've, I've been using Reaper paints all weekend, and uh, they're just a joy to use. So if you guys come out with an airbrush line, man, I'm, I'm all there. <clears throat> uh, what do, you, do you know what you use to prep the Reaper Mini um, paints for your airbrush? Uh, I know a lot of people were curious about that. Like, Yeah, so... Um, on that, on this stuff, on the 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 couple that I've tried, the the polished bone, um, I I used both flow, just the the Liquitex Flow Improver, and uh, I used the 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 Golden Airbrush Medium. I, I tried it in both things, um, and I, I I had a little bit of problems when I was going down to the really tiny needles uh, of just Flow Improver. 
because uh, it it started it it uh, started to break down and and things like that when I needed to get it real thin to get, go through that tiny needle. My bigger needles, my 0.3, my 0.4, no problem with just using flow improver and a little bit of retarder. But if I needed to go smaller detail like that then that, uh, that's when I ended up using the, the uh, golden medium and didn't have any problems whatsoever. Um, I probably can't see it too well here, but I was just messing around with seeing how small of some dots that I could get using that, the, the reapers on my test buck that I've got right here. And uh, that was even with, a, uh, with the Vex with the, uh, the medium needle, and I had no problems going down nice and tiny after I got everything thinned down properly. Awesome. If anybody has any last minute questions, go ahead and put them in chat now. I've been collecting them. Uh, I think we got through most of the questions, really. Uh, a lot of the times people would ask the questions and the topic you were talking about, and then you would start to answer that question. So that kind of worked out perfectly. It was kind of light well, up. That's why I wanted you to interrupt is because it just kind of works into the flow of it. So it's perfect. Um, oh, I, I guess I can spend the, the last couple of minutes. I guess I got about 10, 15 minutes left um, is uh, trying to get some certain effects on there. Um, I go to fabric stores. My daughter is in fashion design, so I got an excuse to go to uh, fabric stores. And I'll pick up things like uh, uh, tool uh, or lace or things like that. And you can lay those down on an object. I'll just use my cleaning pot here. You can just end up laying it down on something like that and then get some neat effects here. You can, uh, the paint that I was using, I was painting some fishing lures for my brother and uh, using this to try to simulate some scales. And uh, if you hold it down perfectly like that uh, and actually conform onto what it is you're painting, then you're gonna have a hard edge. If you have it lift up just a little bit, then you'll have a nice soft edge and kind of that, again, that classic airbrush look uh, of the, the little bit of overspray that goes on there over the, the opaque areas and kind of bleed over. Uh, that's a really common thing when you're doing camouflage, like uh, tricolor NATO camouflage or something like that, to not have that hard edge along there, um, kind of spread it out just a little bit. Um, and same thing with like tool, uh, things like that. What, um, kitchen shelf liner. Uh, it's the, the stuff that's the, the crosshatch thing that you can spray through. Uh, you can lay that down and uh, you put, a, put down like a base coat of black and then lay some of that stuff down and then spray it with silver, just kind of over, uh, just real rough over the top of it. It looks like um, fake diamond plate or fake carbon fiber, depending on the angle that you're looking at. Uh, that, that's kind of neat. Um, you can take a piece of a paper towel right here. Oh, if you're cleaning anything with, with paper towels, um, you know, I, I squirt a little bit of thinner into things and pull the needle out and, and wipe it down, that kind of stuff, uh, or cleaner under the, under the paper towel. Uh, use Viva brand paper towels. They don't um, have any fibers that shred in them. They're just a little bit thicker uh, and, and don't, uh, don't shed fibers in it. Um, they just seem to work a little bit better. But anyway, if you just kind of roughly roughly uh, mess with it right there. You've now got a, a background, uh, a mountain background that you can go on there. So you can go in and spray your mountain color, do another rip, go up a little bit, and then you've got a, a snow capped peak, for example, things like that. Um, and again, if you, if you go nice and tight, you've got that nice, nice hard edge there, pull it back a little bit, it'll kind of feather it a little bit. Um, you can take a uh, index card and punch a hole through it. And if you hold it off about a half inch off the surface and spray it down, then you've got a nice, nice dot uh, of color that goes down that's in a nice soft roundel uh, type, type area. Um, I've, I've uh, replicated a lot of uh, decals and things. I hate decaling. And so I end up replicating a lot of them with paint. I've done that uh, a number of times with just, uh, just a little dot in there and away you go. Um, here we go. Here's one from Mini Painting Studio. It says, "Have you noticed how accurate the Bex is from a distance? I've noticed it. Much, it's much better than my Eclipse." Is what he says. So all of that is it, uh, uh, yes, I have. Um, but again, that's all due to the amount of polish that's on that front end, that that needle and nozzle combination. Uh, th again, that's where your money is going is is into that needle and nozzle. And so yes, the the Vex, is, it, like I say, is an extremely good, uh, well built. Uh, airbrush and so yeah that that matching of that that needle and nozzle is just really really tight and so it does it, it it's able to keep that spray contained uh, in, in a much finer finer area even on the medium ne uh, needle it just seems to keep it uh, contained uh, much better uh, my harder in Steenbeck uh, for example when I spray back a little bit farther uh, it it um, it 
it atomizes the paint uh, finer, but it clouds just a little bit more. It, it goes out in even just a little bit more directional uh, than, the, than my VEX. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with the VEX. Uh, how, one more thing uh, to be careful of with the VEX, though, is that if you do drop it and you bend the needle, when you pull the, since you have to pull the needle out the back end with this barbell on the end, then if, if it's got a good hook on it, it may catch that nozzle and crack your nozzle. Uh, and so you may end up having to replace that if you, if, if, or you might be able to try to bend it a little bit back forward. You've already ruined the needle, so there's no harm in trying to, uh, to try to bend it back to try to fix the, the nozzle until you can uh, get the needle out safely. Other airbrushes, um, like my harder, my harder and steam back here, uh, you can actually push the, the needle out through the front if you've broken it. Um, that's not an uncommon thing. My, as you can see, my Eclipse, I have to go through the back here with this, but this, this has got what's called a triple action handle on it. And so I can just do one, one little twist and the, uh, the needle comes out. Um, so that, that's not an uncommon problem, but it's just something to watch out for. It's certainly not a reason to knock the Vex. Very common. <laughs> um, and then as we start to end up here, somebody was asking if you had a Twitch channel or any social media that you would like to You to know, plug. it's it, it's funny. This is actually the very first time mm -hmm. I've ever been on Twitch. So I really don't. Um, but it's actually been making me think maybe I should because, again, I see an awful lot of stuff out there on how to – how to spray with an airbrush, you know, how to, how to get in there and be detailed and stuff. I don't see a lot on how to actually take care of them. Um, so I've, I've thought about it, but I don't have any. So I, I guess I should shout out like and subscribe uh, just so that I can practice, but uh, not yet. Uh, you, can, you can find my, my model club out on Facebook, though, by looking for IPMS commies, and we're, we're happy to talk about uh, any of your, your problems there. Um, and I also, again, uh, I still make a shout out to Tag Team Hobbies, Tom Grossman. He is, he is considered the airbrush whisperer and uh, can also help you with anything uh, out there. And he's, again, he's also on Facebook too, tagteamhobbies.com. Yeah, I know that you've been getting a lot of feedback from this, this weekend. Uh, you, taught the, you taught this class every day during Reapercon. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people were like, if I couldn't took it this day, they were coming the next day or the, the following day, depending on how the class schedule worked up. And I know that it was it was very important for a lot of people, especially with the Vex coming out and airbrushes kind of on the special pre-release for this weekend and things like that. So I really we really appreciate it. Absolutely. I mean, th this is kind of one of my passions is is teaching. I teach two classes at, at cons. I teach one on color theory and I teach one on on airbrush maintenance. And they're always very, very well attended. And I, I've really missed my cons this year. So I am just thrilled the pieces that I could, uh, I could attend ReaperCon. I told my family that uh, I'm taking four days and you're not going to see me. I'm going to be at ReaperCon the whole time. <laughs> yeah. And you also took classes. I remember you were, we were talking before the show about all the classes that you were taking. And, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Like I say, I haven't painted a mini in about five years. And so I just, it was like drinking from a fire hose. It was, it was outstanding. I, I can't wait for it. I, I like I say, I, I've not, able to travel in September. I've got uh, kids and so they're with school and things like that. I just, I just can't go. And so this virtual ReaperCon has just been a godsend for me. All right. Um, I guess we'll do our, our last little shout outs here. Um, and then we'll, we'll start to get ready for the uh, Miniature Monday with Josh Davis, Mini Painting Studio. He's going to be painting the ReaperCon Sophie uh, paint along uh, as we do every Miniature Monday at 3 p.m. Central. So that's coming up soon. We have a little break right before that starts. Um, and then at the same time, there's also Lauren Cowles teaching Fun with Shiny Paint. Uh, it's about an hour class, so that's coming up later tonight. And then the big finale. We're going to be announcing the crew winners and talking about the future of Reaper and doing our little closing ceremony. And then that's the end of ReaperCon. I do have two, uh, two other things to, to point out. I think, John, you probably pasted them already to the chat, but there's a, a kind of an Airbrush 101 handout that I've, I've come up with that, that also has some drills on how to do uh, precision, more precision airbrush of, of like a, a dot and how to do the dagger stroke and how to do a, a crescent, uh, some basic maintenance and how to select a, a proper airbrush. That's, that's a PDF uh, that I, that, is available. I think John will probably post that into the chat. And it's then like also right there's the, the plans on how to make a portable spray booth and that booth bomb are, are available at starshipmodeler.com. And John's got the full link for that as well. 
and I'm posting that link right now as well. The, uh, the one thing to notice on that spray booth, thanks, John, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the one thing to notice on that spray booth is that it uses a bathroom fan, and that is not a, an explosion-proof fan, so don't use anything that, uh, that is flammable. Don't spray enamels through it, uh, lacquers, et cetera. Just use it for just acrylics. Okay, and then that's it. Uh, we'll be going to the we'll be right back soon, and we'll probably give a little bit of an update um, as regarding that. So check the Discord and all that stuff, and then we'll be ready to go. So thanks, Dan, for the class. I know a lot of people uh, really love it. So wave to the camera as we as we say bye. bye Absolutely. Everyone. Hey. I, I've had an absolute ball this weekend. I, I can't tell you how good this has been for my mental health to to just know that there's so many other people out there. And and even though that we're all virtual, we're all still doing the same thing. I mean, th th this has been fantastic. So I, I thank you guys too. And I, I thank you for, for letting me teach uh, this class every day. Uh, thanks for sending me a Vex to try out. It's a fantastic brush. I, I absolutely love it. Um, and uh, I just can't thank you guys enough. This is this has been an absolute joy for me. Awesome. Maybe we'll have a we'll we'll have you back in the future. Obviously, you'll sign up for more classes and all that. Stuff Absolutely, I like that. All, all right. right. Take care, Bye, everybody. Everyone. Have a good one. See ya.